Hey, witchy nibblings. Auntie Lorelei here. Uh, coming back at you with some more Blade and Broom witchy topics and discussion. Um, today we're going to be talking about this book, uh, Call of the Horned Piper by Nigel Aldcroft Jackson. I'm actually going to be reading some excerpts. If you're only here for that, skip ahead to this timestamp. Um, but if you'd like to hear about some changes in format that are going to happen here at the channel, then stick around um, for now. So I'm trying my best to move into uh, recording some videos and getting content out that doesn't require me to do quite so much editing. I get very awkward about the pauses that I make when I'm talking and I don't like hearing them because frankly my brain just stops for a second and puts a hold on everything while the squirrels in there go, have you thought about this? Maybe you could say that. There's this other thing that you're not going to talk about, but it's going on too. And so <laughs> I have these awkward gaps when I'm, when I'm recording and you don't usually see that because I usually edit the thing within an inch of its life. But I don't have the kind of time and space in my life for all that editing. It's a lot. It is a lot. So I'm going to try to do some more still keeping things concise and like on track, but just talking to the camera and showing you the things and not so much editing and that kind of stuff. So that's that. And if you notice a difference in the way that the videos then look moving forward, there's going to be, um, there's going to be a lot less of that like post-production stuff um, that I need to do. Okay, and here we are. Thank you for joining us to talk about Call of the Horned Piper. So um, this is one of those amazing books that gets recommended by a lot of trad crafters um, who've been around for a while recommending it to trad crafters that are just coming in. And one of the big frustrations with both of these lovely books, this is Masks of Misrule, also by Nigel Jackson, is that they're out of print. They've been out of print for a while. They were published by Capelban Publishing, um, which was a small, like, mom-and-pop publishing shop in the UK. Um, and as I understand it, I don't know all the details, um, although I think people in the UK might be able to comment on that. But as I understand it, one of the partners in the, in the marriage and the couple passed away, and the other one didn't necessarily want to or have the ability to keep running it on their own, which means that... <sighs> These books are no longer in print, and it is so sad because they are on, they are always on my recommended reading list. And I'm hoping to share with you today why that is. I'm going to read a couple of passages um, for educational purposes, just to like get the feeling to you about what's going on, why these books are considered so magical and wonderful, and, um, and, and they just really are. They're like super fantastic. So there's a, a level of education and like literacy that comes through in these in terms of, you know, like what Nigel Jackson has researched, what he's studied. Um, they're not necessarily big on like bibliographies at the end. If you're the kind of trad crafter that's really looking for, you know, those kinds of sources and that kind of thing, you're not necessarily going to find that, but there are references um, sort of inline references without always being cited in the book. Um, there's also just a lot of what I would call mythopoesis, you know, that um, sort of poetic way of speaking, a lot of figurative language, a lot of riddle, a lot of um, metaphor and that kind of thing that, that comes through and that just really communicates very well the, the mysteries within the craft that that it's right there for the grasping of it but it's hard to cite with bibliography <laughs> so i'm going to read just a couple of short passages um that i hope you enjoy so this is call of the horn piper and we're looking at um the chapter that's called broomsticks grease birds and the gandry isn't that a lovely title an owl comes, no, that's not. 
An owl calls from the dark windswept woods, and the tide of midnight draws nigh in the cottage whose chamber is alight with red tapers. A woman unbinds her long hair and begins chanting her call to the dark robed master and the wild mistress of the night. In the flickering gloom, her black cat sports restively as the witch's incantation echoes about the low beamed room. She now begins to anoint her brow, temples, and soles of her feet with a goose feather from a small pot of dark green oil, kneeling by a birch twig besom. Swirling mists slowly begin to wreathe the chamber as she enters into the dream trancing of the Dwell spirits. The sonorous Sabbath call continues as her spirit begins to leave her body. It is being sung through her. I gotta take these off. I can't see this close. Her lips whisper the words, horse and haddock in the devil's name. And then she is astride the besom, riding upwards through the broad chimney hole. Up into the clouds and the starlight soars the witch, riding through the windy darkness, over meadow, river, and dale to the caverns of the Sabbat Mountain, and down into the netherworld of the Nine Mothers. I'm going to read just a little more. This archetypal image of the witch's nocturnal broomstick flight, so deeply ingrained in the European folk consciousness, derives its potency from its truly archaic roots. In traditional witchcraft, the broomstick is the symbolic means whereby the journey is taken beyond this world and into the unfathomable realms of the underworld. It is essential to understand the magico-poetic code employed here. For in the shamanistic context, flight always alludes to trance ecstasy and the visionary movement of the spirit. I'm going to stop there and choose a different selection. This one is the chapter titled The Mark of the Witch. And it's a it's a short chapter. It's like a page and a half. Yes, page and a half. The Mark of the Witch. Throughout the accounts of European witchery, the devil's mark features as a recurring element. This witch mark seems to have been a colored character or tattooed sign that the horned master or devil made upon a new member of the company at the time of their admission into witchcraft. This mark was eagerly sought by the later witch finders of the 16th and 17th centuries, as it was held to constitute irrefutable proof of an, of an individual's membership of the sect. As Reginald Scott wrote in 1594, the devil giveth to every novice a mark, either with his teeth or with his claws. The forms which the devil's mark took varied from region to region, often consisting of little more than a blue, black, or red spot on various parts of the body, often being found upon one of the fingers of the hand. In Somerset, the witches were marked between the upper and middle joints of the ring finger, or fourth finger of the right hand. Um, yeah, in 1597, Andro an Aberdeen witch, was said to have been marked by the horned one on the third finger of the right hand. A witch at Yarmouth in 1644 told how one moonlit night a tall black man knocked on her door and told her that he must first see her hand and then taking out something like a penknife, he gave it a little scratch so that blood flowed and the mark remained to that time. Elsewhere, the devil's mark was of a more explicitly symbolic nature and consisted of small totemic glyphs and sigils. Martin Del Rio reports that the witches are marked with secret signs such as the hare's footprint, the rat's footprint, or the character of the spider. The hare is deeply connected with the nocturnal mysteries of the moon. The rat appears in ancient Romano-Gaulish iconography of Cernunos god of the underworld, and the spider, as a weaver of webs, is sacred to the spinning goddesses of fate, such as the Norns, Parquet, and Matrone. In rural England, the mark is sometimes known to be in the shape of a dormouse. Henri Boguet suggests, or attests to the fact that the 16th century French witches received the Marc les Sorcières upon the left, or sinister shoulder, in the form of the hare's foot. He mentioned Jean de Vaux, whose witch mark was un petit chien noir, the black dog of night death in the netherworld. 
Amongst the Basque witches of the Pyrenees, three marks were made upon the left thigh, the left side, and over the left eye. The devil often marked Basque witches with the sign of the toad or the toad's foot, a most holy amphibian in witcha craft, which is associated with the subterranean marshes, caves, and chthonic waters of the nether netherworld. And our last passage is the chapter on the witch's compass. It's on page 83 of um, Call of the Horn Piper. The witch's compass or magic circle circumscribes and delineates the sacred space of the craft workings. Its roots go back to the circular nematon of the Celts and ultimately to the megalithic circles of ancient Europe. The compass is a temple, a sanctuary, and a cosmogram in whose bounds the witch is projected into sacred time, where all worlds and acts become archetypal and primordial in their power. It is thus the true cosmological pattern of the microcosm and macrocosm to the witches. The four quarters of the compass in the traditional craft are ascribed the following qualities and magico-symbolic correspondences. East, fire, red, the sun, awakening, light, youth, creative energy, the ram-horned god, and the fiery smith, the hair goddess, fox, the right hand, birch twig besom, and sword or knife. South is earth, white, love, warmth, life, fertile abundance, sovereignty, the goddess of land and corn, the rose queen, mare, bee, feet and genitals, oaken stave, and the godstone or the anvil, red threaders. West is water, which is gray, green, the moon, mist, sound, shade, age, reflective energy, the ladies of the lake, the swan, the cat, the toad, the left hand, the cauldron or cup, the comb, and the mirror and apple. And then north, finally, is air, black, the pole star, cold, sleep and death, truth, fate, initiation, Dame Herodias, and Old Horny, the wild hunt or the fairy raid, goat, owl, black hound, crow, stang, and hagstone, and the head. So I have done another video on um, some cosmology. I'll link it whichever side. I don't know, my camera might be flipped. So in the place where things get linked, um, there is um, a discussion on metaphysics and how the metaphysics of traditional witchcraft are, are using energy in different ways, um, with north being air, south being earth, because north is where your head is, is sort of the idea if you were to flip that circle up. Um, so north is or, or air, south is earth, east is fire, west is water, um, and how that just affects things differently because the energy is moving in a different way. It's being pulled into the center as opposed to being pushed around the perimeter and raised up into a cone. Um, so anyway, again, my highest recommendations for this book, if you have access to it, read it. And Mr. Jackson, if you would uh, like to republish it, um, Asteria Books would be oh so honored. <laughs> <laughs> um, I don't even know if that's possible. We'd have to get into like who has the copyrights and, and where all that stuff is. But I know that I, for one, would love to see, echo me in the comments if you're with me on this, somebody, somebody be able to have the rights to republish these books and others. There are other amazing Capel Band books that need to be out there. Um, and that's all for today. That's all we're doing today, was just taking a, a walk down some literature that you might not have access to elsewhere. I hope you have a, a wonderful witchy week, and that you join me back here next week for more witchy goodness. Bye!